What's going on YouTube? This is Brent0331. In this episode of Infantryman's Guide, we're going to be talking about the M18A1 Claymore Anti-Personnel Mine. We'll be talking about its characteristics, its nomenclature, and some considerations for employment of the mine. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to leave a comment. The M18A1 is a directional, fixed fragmentational mine. The mine has a total weight of three and a half pounds and is approximately eight and a half inches long and three and one fourth inches tall with the legs folded. When deployed in the controlled roll, it is treated as a one-shot weapon. It's primarily designed for use against massed infantry attacks. However, its fragments are also effective against light-skinned vehicles such as technicals. The M18A1 is equipped with a fixed plastic knife edge sight or a slit type peat sight. It has adjustable folding legs and two detonator wells. The mine and all of its accessories are carried in the M7 bandolier. The outer surface of the mine is a curved rectangular olive drab molded case of fiberglass filled plastic. The front portion of the case is a fragmentation face containing steel spheres and a plastic matrix. The back portion of the case behind the matrix contains a layer of one and a half pounds of composition C4. When detonated, the M18A1 mine will deliver spherical steel fragments over a 60 degree fan shaped arc pattern that is 2 meters high and 50 meters wide at a range of 50 meters. These fragments are moderately effective up to a range of 100 meters and can travel up to 250 meters forward of the mine. The optimum effective range, which is the range at which the most desirable balance between lethality and the area covered is achieved at 50 meters. Friendly troops are prohibited to the rear and to the sides of the mine within a radius of 16 meters, which is the minimum safe operating distance from the mine. At this distance, and regardless of how the mine is employed, the operator must be in a fighting hole behind cover or laying prone in a depression to prevent from being injured by flying secondary objects. The M18A1 Claymore is a very effective weapon, but we aren't the only ones that employ this weapon on the modern battlefield. Countries all over the world utilize this very mine or a variant of it, which increases the likelihood that this very same weapon can and has been used against U.S. and coalition forces. Additionally, during the Cold War, the Soviet Union had produced an anti-personnel mine which is nearly identical to the M18A1 in form and function. That mine is the MON50 and its variants. Just like other Soviet bloc weapons, it was exported by the Soviets all over the world, so it is also a weapon that is very likely to end up in terrorist or hostile nation hands, with the potential of being used against us. Let's look at the nomenclature of this mine. The mine has two detonator wells located at the top which allow for a single or dual priming. There are two shipping plug priming adapters in each detonator well. The plug end seals the well to prevent entry of foreign materials from getting inside them when they're not in use. The slotted end of the shipping plug priming adapter is used to hold the electrical blasting cap in place when the mine is armed. This is your knife edge sight or slit type peep sight if you have that version of the mine. At the bottom of the mine will be two scissor type folding legs which enable the mine to be placed into the ground. The mine can also be tied to a post, trees, or anything else your creative mine can fathom. This is the M57 firing device. It is a handheld pulse generator. A squeeze of the handle produces a 3 volt electrical pulse which is sufficient energy to fire the electrical blasting cap through 100 feet of firing wire which is issued with each mine. The device contains a rubberized connecting plug with a dust cover. Also on the firing device is a safety bale which has two positions, up for safe and all the way down for fire. This is the M4 electric blasting cap which is attached to 100 feet of firing wire wrapped around a rectangular plastic spool in which the blasting cap is stored when not inside the mine. At the other end of the firing wire is a combination shorting plug and dust cover. The M40 test set is an instrument used for checking the continuity of the initiating circuit of the mine. Only one of the six bandoliers in each packing box contains a test set. 
An identification tag on the carrying strap will mark the bandolier containing the test set. This is the M7 bandolier. It is constructed of a water resistant olive drive canvas and has snap fasteners to secure the top. The bandolier has two deep pockets. One pocket contains the mine and the other contains a firing device, a test set, and the spool of 100 feet of firing wire with the attached blasting cap. Instructions for how to use the mine are sewn into the top flap of the bandolier for quick and easy reference. The M18A1 Claymore mine was developed after U.S. troops experienced mass wave attacks by the Chinese during the Korean War. Although it was primarily designed as a defense against mass infantry attacks, the mine has proven itself as an invaluable asset when used in an ambush. The Claymore mine is probably one of the best initiating devices of an ambush available. When enemy forces entered your kill box and the mine is touched off, its effects can leave the enemy in a disoriented state of confusion, which enables your forces to seize the initiative and achieve immediate fire su superiority. When employing the mine, place it in a concealed position where its effects will cover likely avenues of enemy approach. Mines can either be placed and fired individually, or specially trained personnel can rig several mines together to be designated at the same time. This is known as daisy chaining. The first thing you'll want to do is to inspect the mine and all its components to ensure that everything appears serviceable and that there is no obvious defects. Next we're going to test the M57 firing device. Ensuring that our firing device's safety bail is rotated to, into the safe position, we're going to then take the M40 test set and remove the dust covers so that we can insert the plugs into one another. Once the test set is firmly connected to the firing device, we're going to move the safety bail to the downward firing position and depress the handle on the M57 firing device with a firm, quick squeeze. You should observe the flashing of the lamp through the window on the M40 test set. The flashing of the lamp indicates that the M57 firing device is functioning properly. If the lamp is not flashing on and off, it could be caused by corrosion on the electrical connectors of the M40 test set. Connecting and disconnecting the shorting plug dust cover on the M40 test set can overcome this. If you still do not observe the lamp flashing, Try the test set on another M57 firing device. If the M40 test set indicates that several M57 firing devices are faulty, retest with another M40 test set since the first one may be defective. After determining that the M57 firing device and M40 test set are operating correctly, return the safety bail to the safe position. We are now going to test our firing wire and M4 electrical blasting cap. First place the spool with the blasting cap inside of it in a safe location away from you and ensure that no friendly personnel are nearby in the event that the blasting cap detonates upon testing. Now that everything is in place, connect the firing wire to the M40 test set. Move the safety bail to the firing position and firmly depress the handle. The flash of the lamp inside the window of the test set indicates that the blasting cap circuitry is satisfactory. If no flash is present, replace the blasting cap and retest. Immediately after the circuit test, the M57 firing device is placed on safe and disconnected from the firing wire. Firing device is then placed inside the bandolier, which is retained on the operator's body. Firing device should stay on the operator's body during installation of the mine. 
This is done to prevent accidental firing by a second marine or soldier while you are downrange installing the mine. Remove the electrical firing wire leaving the mine and the other accessories inside the bandolier. Secure the shorting plug into the firing wire at the firing position by wrapping around a stake or other sturdy object. Unroll the firing wire to the position selected for emplacing the mine. The firing wire should always be laid from the firing position to the mine emplacement site. Once again, wrap the wire around a stake or sturdy object approximately one meter behind the mine so that it will not become misaligned should the firing wire be disturbed. Remove the mine from the bandolier. Turn the legs of the mine rearward and then downward and spread each pair of legs about 45 degrees. One leg should protrude to the front and the other leg should protrude to the rear. Position mine with the surface marked front toward enemy pointing in the direction of the enemy or the desired area of fire. Now place the mine into the ground by pushing the legs into the earth. In areas that the legs cannot be placed into the ground, the legs of the mine can be spread to the maximum of 180 degrees to the front and rear so that the mine can have a sturdy base to sit on. To aim the mine, mines with knife edge sights like the one I feature in this video, you position the eye about 6 inches or 15 centimeters to the rear of the sight. Aim the mine by aligning the two edges of the sight with the aiming point. A straight stick or pen can help facilitate aiming. Mines with slit type peep sights will select an aiming point that is approximately 100 feet or 50 meters to the front of the mine and about 8 feet or 2.5 meters above the ground. You will aim the mine by sighting through the peep sight. The groove of the sight should be in line with the aiming point in which the aiming point should be in the center of the desired area of coverage. To arm the mine, unscrew one of the shipping plug priming adapters from the mine. Slide the slotted end of the shipping plug priming adapter onto the firing wires of the blasting cap between the crimp connections and the blasting cap. Insert the blasting cap with the priming adapter screwing it into the detonator well until it is firmly secure. Upon completion of this, you will then recheck the aim of the mine to ensure that the point aim is not shifted during the installation of the blasting cap and priming adapter. Once complete, it is necessary to camouflage both the front and back of the mine into the surroundings to prevent detection by the enemy. Use only lightweight foliage such as leaves and grass to avoid increasing the risk of debris hazards 
to the rear of the mine. Additionally, the firing wire should also be camouflaged by either foliage or burying it. Once the mine has been camouflaged, return to your firing position. You will now conduct a final test of the mine circuit. Ensuring that all friendly personnel are safe and clear of the mine, and your M57 firing device's safety bail is in the safe position, you can now reconnect the M40 test set and then connect the firing wire to the test set. To press the firing device's handle with a firm quick squeeze and you should see the indicating lamp on the test set. If you have a successful test, you are now ready to connect the mine. After placing the M57 firing device back on safe, remove the firing wire and the M40 test set from the M57 firing device. After retaining the M40 test set in the bandolier, connect the firing wire into the M57 firing device. The bind is now fully operational and ready to go. To detonate the mine, move the safety bale from the safe position to the firing position. Once your target is in the kill zone, you will then fire the mine by depressing the firing device handle with a firm quick squeeze. It is good practice to depress the handle firmly three full times in rapid succession to ensure that the mine is fired. One additional feature on the M7 bandolier is that located on the inside of the top flap are several sewn-in loops. These loops are incorporated into the bandolier to help organize firing wires that are going from the same firing position to different claymore emplacements. This way it helps you keep track of which wires belong to which claymore emplacement so that you don't accidentally touch off the wrong claymore at the moment of truth. This is especially handy when you're sitting in the defense and one fighting position may have several claymores that they're responsible for that are covering multiple avenues of likely enemy approach.
In the event that the mine is not used and you need to disarm and recover it, you will utilize the following procedures. Prior to disarming the mine, the firing device's safety bale must be in the safe position. Then disconnect the firing wire from the firing device. Replace the shorting plug dust cover on both the firing wire connector and the dust cover on the firing device's connector. Once this has been done, secure the firing device inside your bandolier and you are now safe to proceed downrange to your mine's position. Next you will unscrew and remove the shipping plug priming adapter containing the blasting cap from the mine. Remove the blasting cap and firing wire from the shipping plug priming adapter. You will then reverse the shipping plug priming adapter and unscrew the plug end into the detonator well to seal it. Lastly, you will remove the mine from its emplacement and repack the mine and all of its accessories into the respective pockets of the M7 bandolier. Well, that's it, YouTube. That includes this episode of Infantryman's Guide over the M18A1 Claymore. If you like what you see, don't forget to check out my channel and subscribe. I've already done several infantry-related videos, and I plan on doing several more in the future. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to leave a comment.